You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is, Jacob Volk. Hello, sports fans. Welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk. And at the end of this show, you're going to get an interview that I did with Joe Sigman, the author of Jewish Sports Legends, the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. But I have to start with the NBA playoffs and recapping yesterday's four games. There were three great games and one game that was over in the second quarter. Before I get into that game, I'll talk about the great one, the one that was being hailed as an instant classic. And you can certainly make an argument for that. Nuggets jazz, it goes into overtime. Donovan Mitchell puts up a Herculean game where he uh, scores 57 points the third most points ever scored in a playoff game. But the Jazz still falls short, and they lose by 10 to the Nuggets, 135-125. to There's a lot to break down with this game, namely the fact that despite scoring 57 points, Mitchell still couldn't lead his team to victory. It wasn't his fault, But the Jazz still lost. I mean, the simple fact is they're a team that prides themselves on their defense. They're starting Royce O'Neal. Royce O'Neal does nothing except play defense. He's not an offensive threat at all. And Rudy Gobert is a really good defender in the paint. There's a reason he's called the Stifle Tower. I mean, this year, the Jazz allowed just under 109 points per game. That's the ninth fewest total in the league. But they just couldn't stop the Nuggets' incredibly well-rounded offense. They got production up and down the lineup. Six players scored in double figures. Even a guy like Torrey Craig, who's another all-defense, no-offense guy, got in on the action. He scored 11. Michael Porter Jr. disappointed a little bit. He's got to take more than 13 shots, and he also has to hit more than five of those shots. He finished with 13 and 8. He wasn't bad, But he wasn't great. I just expected more from him based on how he was playing in the seeding games. I mean, the thing that would really tick me off as a Jazz fan is the fact that Rudy Gobert couldn't stop Nikola Jokic. I'm not saying you need to shut him down wholly. Jokic is going to get his no matter what. But Gobert's the kind of guy who should be expected to limit his effectiveness. And Jokic still dropped 29-10. and He was insane. He wasn't even passing the ball that much. He only had three assists. Jamal Murray with a fantastic game, dropping 36 points and nine assists. For as great as Donovan Mitchell was offensively, he was terrible defensively in stopping Murray. That and that terrible eight-second violation that he took 
late in the fourth quarter. The Jazz are up four, and he takes an eight-second call. I mean, how do you do that? You're the point guard. The shot clock is right there. How do you miss that? How do you take that type of a call in that type of a situation? If he didn't drop 57, there would be people in Utah screaming for his head right now. I mean, I'll tell you, I don't care who you are. To me, there's no excuse for that. That took away a lot of what he did. Because right after that 8-second call, Jamal Murray hit a 3 to make it a 1-point game. If the Jazz score in that possession, they're up 5 or 6 or 7, whatever. Maybe even 8 if it's a 4-point play. And the game's over. You don't know if they would have scored, but the way Donovan Mitchell was playing offensively, he'd have scored. I mean, that is an incredibly boneheaded play. That's right up there with J.R. Smith thinking that the Cavs were ahead against the Warriors in 2018 in Game 1 of the NBA Finals. That changed the game right there. It was a great offensive game, but everything else, disastrous. Moving on now to Nets Raptors. And I want to tell you something about this game. I had someone over at my house who left at 3.15. The game started at 4. So I'm thinking, okay, I have 45 minutes, plenty of time. But I see on Twitter that the Islanders Pro Shop at the Northwell Health Ice Center, which is right by my house, is selling Stanley Cup playoff shirts. I wanted a shirt. So I was doing the calculation. Can I get there and back in time to watch the opening tip? I ventured out at about 3.30. I left a little later than I'd have liked to, but I had to use the restroom. And I'm telling you, I was booking it. I mean, I didn't care about anything else. I just wanted to get my t-shirt and get back in time for the opening tip. And I got my t-shirt at about 3.50-ish, 3.55-ish, maybe. So I'm thinking, okay, there's no way I'm going to make it back in time for a 4 p.m. tip. But the game isn't going to start at 4. This isn't college football. The game tipped off closer to 4.10. And I made it back in time for that. But I'll tell you, I was gunning it. I was going 60 miles an hour. Like, no one could stop me. I was getting to my house in time for the opening tip. I ran into my house. I put all the stuff away. And I turned on yes. Almost... Immediately, I regretted rushing back to watch this game. Garrett Temple missing wide open shots. He was 1 for 10 from beyond the arc. I mean, that's inexcusable. The guy couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. I mean, my God. The Raptors were running and the Nets couldn't stop him. Their transition game was great. I mean, the Nets' transition game on offense was actually pretty good, but defensively, lifeless. They just could not stop Fred Van Vliet on the fast break. Whenever the Nets missed a shot, it was run, run, run. And I don't know what it was, but the Nets just couldn't stop it. And really quickly... They were down by 20. I mean, you have no idea how much I wanted to watch this game. I was so excited for this game. The Nets were playing well in the seeding games. I picked Raptors in six, but 
You know, I did think the Nets would play him tough. Oh my gosh. I mean, I saw Nets fans saying, Hey, look. You know, don't worry about it. They lost the first game of the regular season, and they lost the first seeding game. That all worked out. Yeah, the thing is, though, this is the playoffs. You can't just write off a loss in game one. Especially when you look that bad. Defensively, the Nets were atrocious. The Raptors hit 50% of their threes. 22 for 44. Beyond the arc. The Raptors shot 33 free throws in this game. And made 32. How on God's green earth do you allow that? How do you as a coach not say to your team, Stop fouling for the love of God. Get your hands up. The Nets never led in this game. Never. The Raptors were up by as much as 33. You want me to give the Nets credit for making the deficit as small as 8 when it was 33 at one point? No, I will not give them credit for that because it never should have been 33 in the first place. Don't allow it to get to that point. This was a horror show. This was a train wreck. This game was over in the second quarter. I turned it off. I was watching the hockey game. I couldn't stand it anymore. You play the worst basketball you've ever played in your life. In a playoff game. Everyone on the Nets, with the exception of Timothy Luwawu Cabarro, who dropped 26, I give him credit. He's earned a spot on this team going forward. But everyone else should be ashamed of themselves. But Joe Harris, I apologize. Harris played well, too. Karis LeVert, maybe I apologize. The rest of you, you stink. Moving on now to Sixers Celtics. And look... I called this game. I said this series was going to be close. I said Joel Embiid was going to be a huge factor because the Celtics didn't have anyone that could stop him. I said that the Celtics' four big guns would show up. They did. Gordon Hayward didn't play great. But he still had 12 points and he had four steals. He was really good defensively. I'll take that. Especially when you have Jason Tatum scoring 32 and grabbing 13 boards. And Jalen Brown drops 29. It's okay if Hayward's a little off. I mean, it didn't even matter that Marcus Smart only had two points despite playing 32 minutes. And both of those points came on free throws. He was 0 for 5 from the field, 0 for 3 from beyond the arc. The Celtics played... Great in this game. Would you like them to improve their perimeter game a little bit? Yeah, I guess. But they haven't been a great shooting team all year. When you look at three-point percentage, they're middle of the pack. 13 out of 30. They're not awful, but they're not great. I thought the Celtics were fine. They certainly played well enough to win, especially without Ben Simmons. If the Sixers had had Ben Simmons, yeah, they would have won this game. I mean, with all due respect to um, Shake Milton, and I like Milton. He is a good player. I liked him coming out of SMU. But he just can't do what Ben Simmons can. Ben Simmons is one of the craftiest penetrators in the NBA. The vision he has at his height is insane. Shake Milton just doesn't bring that. Yeah, he's 6'5". That's tall for 
a point guard, but he's just not as dominant. You don't need me to tell you that. I mean, the Sixers did play well. Embiid was insane, 26 and 16. Dominant performance on the interior. He's going to do that again and again and again. Josh Richardson shot the ball well. Alec Burks was insane. 18 points. That's really good for Burks. I mean, if you get that type of contribution from him, you should win. Tobias Harris had a well-rounded game, 15-8-8. The guy who I really keyed in on as the seminal reason for the Sixers losing is Al Horford. He played 31 minutes, only had 6 points, 7 rebounds, and 6 assists. I like the 6 assists. And the 7 rebounds is solid, but everyone on the Sixers were getting rebounds. The Sixers had 50 rebounds yesterday. Al Horford needs to show up in this series if the Sixers are going to win games. It's just that simple. They can't rely on Burks dropping 18 or Milton dropping 13. It has to be their big free agent addition from last offseason, which seems like a lifetime ago, in Al Horford. Moving on now to Mavericks Clippers. The big story here was Kristaps Porzingis being ejected. And there's a lot to break down with that. He had gotten a technical foul early in the game when he made what I thought was a solid block, but the refs saw it differently. And Porzingis didn't like it. He punched the air and he got a technical. He should not have gotten a technical for that. This is the playoffs. The players need to be able to show emotion. But the second technical, when he shoved Marcus Morris and started a little bit of a brouhaha between the two teams, he deserved a technical there. You can't do that. You cannot do that. I mean, we know that. If he didn't have the technical before, we're not talking about it. I mean, should that have been enough to eject him from the game? Probably not, especially when it's a playoff game. And that whole game changed when Porzingis left. The Mavericks had to rely on Maxi Cleaver a lot to fill that Porzingis role. And Cleaver's not a bad player, but he's not Porzingis. I mean, he was dreadful yesterday. 34 minutes and only 3 points? On 5 shots? He shot 1 for 5 from beyond the arc. Those were his only shots. 6 rebounds, 1 assist. Yeah, that's Porzingis. But look, the second technical should have been a technical. It's the first technical that shouldn't have been a technical. If he doesn't get that first technical, he's not ejected. So we're really not talking about it that much. It shouldn't have been enough to eject him from the game, but those are the rules. Two technicals, and you're out. I mean, evidently, I'm one of the few who thought that was a good call by the refs. A bad call in the first half to call a technical on the block, but a good call to give him a technical for starting the shoving match. But even after that, the Mavericks had a chance to win. Luka Doncic had the best playoff debut you'll ever see. He dropped 42 points with 7 rebounds and 9 assists. He turned the ball over 11 times, which is just a testament to all the great defenders that the Clippers have. They forced him into doing stupid things with the ball. But don't let those 11 turnovers negate 
what was a sensational performance. Those 42 points are the most ever for a player in his first ever playoff game. There's no other word for him other than transcendent. He is a transcendent player, a transcendent talent. He's going to be a superstar in this league for the next 15 years. But when you look at the Clippers, they got production from Kawhi and Paul George. We all knew they were going to. But Marcus Morris had a really good game. A really underrated game. 19 points and 4 steals. He led the Clippers in steals. Ivica Zubac had a double-double. Lou Williams dropped 14 off the bench despite missing two wide-open layups late. The Clippers are just so well-rounded. I mean, they can put five players on the court at any point in the game that you'd be comfortable with closing out a game. It doesn't matter if it's in the second quarter when you want guys to get a little bit of a breather. The five that they have out on the floor is good enough to be the five that you want out there when you're down by one with 23 seconds left in the game. Or when you're up by one with 23 seconds left in the game. There's still my pick to win it all. I said it before the season. I kind of have to stick with them. So I was thinking about how I wanted to do this. Did I want to go to previewing today's NBA games? Or did I want to go to recapping yesterday's NHL games? I like going sport by sport. I think that's easier to follow. So I'll go right to the NBA with Magic Bucks. For the Magic, they have to hope that Giannis oversleeps. I mean, it's just that simple. I said this yesterday. They don't have anyone who can match up with Giannis. I mean, Giannis is too much for anyone, let alone a mediocre Magic team. That's without their best defender in John Isaac. I mean, the Magic don't have anyone who's even going to make Giannis work. It wouldn't surprise me if he dropped 30 in every single one of these games. And for the Bucks, it's really simple. Just stick with the formula. You know what you need to do to win. Play through Giannis. Let him kick it out to wide open shooters. Do what you did to get 56 wins. Do what you did to be the best team in the NBA this year. They don't need to reinvent the wheel. They really, really don't. Moving on now to Heat Pacers. And the Heat need to contain TJ Warren. They need to have Jimmy Butler on him at all times. Even though Butler sort of, kind of underachieved a little bit this year with the Heat, he's still really good defensively. He's going to be able to make T.J. Warren work. It's possible that Andre Iguodala could get some run also. We know the type of talent he is defensively. I mean, if he can stop LeBron James in the NBA Finals, he can stop T.J. Warren in the first round. That's what the Heat need to do. They need to contain T.J. Warren. And that plays in perfectly with what the Pacers need to do to win this game. You can't count on T.J. Warren to drop 30 points against the Heat. Is it possible? Yes. He's bubble Jesus. But it's highly unlikely. What's not getting talked about, and it really should, is that On the 10th, 
So, last week, yesterday, the Heat played the Pacers and beat them by 22. T.J. Warren was dreadful. He was 5 for 14 from the field. He only had 12 points. Because of that, the Pacers need to get more from their supporting cast. They need Victor Oladipo to be the Victor Oladipo of old. They need Malcolm Brogdon to be the Malcolm Brogdon that he was last year in Milwaukee. They need Miles Turner to be a dominant force in the interior. I mean, that's going to be a fun matchup to watch. Turner versus Bam Adebayo. This is going to be a really exciting game. I picked the Heat to win this series, but I did pick them in seven games. This is going to be a really, really exciting series. Moving on now to Thunder Rockets. And the Thunder need to exploit the absence of Russell Westbrook. While everyone talks about James Harden and the small ball offense that the Rockets play with the uh, seven seconds or less coach, Mike D'Antoni, that's really, I don't want to say a revolutionary offense, but it's an offense unlike any you've ever seen before. What doesn't get talked about as much is their defense. James Harden stepped up his defense this year. Russell Westbrook has always been a really good defender. P.J. Tucker has always been a really good defender. Robert Covington has always been a really good defender. Austin Rivers has always been a good defender. Yes, you can shoot the lights out, but if you can't stop anyone... How much good is that going to do you? See, the thing is, with the Rockets, the stats are misleading. If you look at points against per game, the Rockets are at the bottom of the league. But, the thing is, they give up a lot of possessions. Because they're shooting the ball so quickly, the opponent gets the ball back really quickly... So, of course, they're going to score more points. If you look at defensive rating, the Rockets are closer to the middle of the pack. I mean, I don't think those stats are gospel, offensive rating and defensive rating, but it does mean something. Analytics for the NBA work somewhat. It's just for baseball and hockey that they don't. So, my point in mentioning this is that the Thunder are going to have to exploit the absence of one of the game's better defenders. I'm looking at guys like Shea Gilders Alexander or Chris Paul to go off. 20 isn't enough. I want at least 25. James Harden can only defend one of them. Even if you want to get the ball inside to Steven Adams and let him post up Robert Covington or P.J. Tucker or whoever is going to be the center, do that. Exploit the weaknesses on the Rockets roster now. That's the biggest thing. They have a guy who can take advantage of the Rockets not having a true center, and they have guys who can make you really miss Russell Westbrook if you're... A Rockets fan. As for the Rockets, it's really, really simple what they need to do. Shoot the lights out. I know that's the obvious thing to say, but look, I can't make anything up and say the Rockets have to play great defense and win a grit and grind game. That's not their game. If it's a low-scoring game, the Rockets are going to lose. They need James Harden to go off. They need their three-point shooting to be great. A guy like Ben McLemore, I think, is actually going to be really important in this series. Because he's the second-best shooter that 
the Rockets have. I'd like to see him get more involved now that Westbrook is out. And also, keep up your good defensive play. I saved this for the Rockets' side. The Rockets are third in the NBA in steals per game with 8.7. They're a really good defensive team. Just stick with what got you here. And let Ben McLemore get a little more involved. Moving on now to Trailblazers Lakers. For the Trailblazers to win this game, they need Damian Lillard to be Logo Lillard. They need him to hit those half-court-ish threes that no one can defend. Not even LeBron. They need C.J. McCollum to go off. They need... You know, Carmelo Anthony to have a vintage performance. I mean, I don't see a really likely way for the Trailblazers to win this series. But I think Melo can be a huge part of it. If he can turn into a really reliable third scoring option for the Trailblazers, that's pretty good. That bodes really, really well for them. As for the Lakers, it's really simple. Stick with what got you here. LeBron James and Anthony Davis pick and rolls. Kyle Kuzma is going to keep playing well. Deion Waiters has been shooting the ball well. Danny Green is an established playoff performer. He's a really good shooter. And more than anything, just play great defense. LeBron is going to make Damian Lillard work. I don't see Lillard doing that much against LeBron. He'll still get his, but he's not going to be dropping 40. Anthony Davis is really going to limit Yusuf Nurkic's and Hassan Whiteside's effectiveness, and Zach Collins is going to be minced meat. The Lakers have played great defense this year, really underrated in that regard. Fifth in the NBA in steals per game. Third in the NBA in defensive rating. And fourth in the NBA in opposing points per game. They still need to generate offense, obviously, but with LeBron and AD and... Deion Waiters and Danny Green, that's going to be really easy. It's the defense. It's a guy like Avery Bradley. Really good perimeter defender. It's a guy like LeBron. It's a guy like Anthony Davis. Hell, Danny Green's not a bad perimeter defender. The Lakers are set up really well in this series. There's no question about it. Moving on now to the NHL... And I will start with the game that I saw more of than I thought I was going to in Lightning Blue Jackets. In live time, I did miss the three goals, but obviously I saw them on Twitter. And I'll tell you, Barclay Goodrow has had a really, really good series. He's made himself known defensively. He put up two points in this game. I understand that this is the first time he's been on the score sheet, but he's doing all the little things that don't show up on the score sheet. I like Goodrow. I like him a lot. This was a really even game. Both goalies played well. Vasilevsky and Corpusalo. But to even get the puck to them in the first place is a struggle. Their defense in this series, both teams, has been insane. And it shows on the power play. The Lightning are 0 for 9 in this series on the power play. And the Blue Jackets are 2 for 14. I mean, I understand that the Blue Jackets didn't have a good power play this year, but the Lightning were fifth in the league. All right, the Blue Jackets are doing something right on the penalty kill. And same thing for the Lightning. 
As for the Blue Jackets, you know, if I'm going to focus on them specifically, like I said, I thought they played well. They certainly played well enough to win. This was a really even matchup. Every single game in this series has been really, really close. With the exception of Game 2, they've all been one-goal games, and even then, Game 2 was a two-goal game. I mean, when you have a game that goes into quintuple overtime, yeah, those are two evenly matched teams. But this just goes to show that the Blue Jackets don't have the skill level that the Lightning do. Even though John Tortorella is a really good coach, they just don't have the guys that can match up with the Lightning. Even if they don't show up on the score sheet, they just negate everyone else on the ice. They don't get enough credit for their defensive play. Do guys like Tyler Johnson and Pollard and Kucherov and Point. I mean, Point's been great this whole series, but he didn't do much in this game. Victor Hedman obviously gets credit for his defense. He's a perennial Norris Trophy finalist. And Sergachev too, but the forwards really don't, and they should. I wouldn't be upset if I was a Blue Jackets fan. I know it's tough to lose, but your team has played really well in every game this series. I'll take it. You know, it's better than being routed. You came close a bunch of times. That should make you feel a little better. Moving on now to Avalanche Coyotes. And the second that I start saying we should put some respect on Darcy Kemper's name, he lays an egg. He allowed four goals on 22 shots. The Avalanche have destroyed the Coyotes in this series. It's not even close. All right, fine. Game three when Kemper makes 49 saves. But you know what? The Avalanche still had 51 shots in that game. They are the better team by far. They have to be considered the favorites to come out of the Western Conference. I mean, the Coyotes played dreadfully in every single aspect. You cannot have 15 shots in a game and expect to win. They had three shots in the first period and six shots in the second and third periods. They were atrocious. And the one goal that they scored yesterday was a power play goal. How can you get excited about that? They have been destroyed in this series. They have looked dreadful. The Avalanche have looked great. And I'm telling you, they're my pick to come out of the West to play in the Stanley Cup Finals. As for who's going to come out of the East, I don't know. Moving on now to Bruins Hurricanes. And this game really proved to me That this Bruins team is just tenacious. You know, they're not going to quit. Even though Tuka Rask opts out and they have to start Yaroslav Halak for the rest of the playoffs. They're not going to die. Even when they're down 2-0, headed into the third period. They're not going to die. They scored four goals in under seven minutes in the third period. The Hurricanes only had two shots on net in the third period. If you were a Hurricanes fan watching that game, if you broke your TV watching that third period, I don't blame you. I'd have been right there with you. You had a golden opportunity to win this game, and then it turns into a best two out of three, anything can happen, and you blow it. Rod Brindamore has done a terrible job in this series. How on 
God's green earth do you start James Reimer? Why did Peter Morazic not get that start? Morazic only allowed two goals in game three. He made 36 saves. He's the better goalie. James Reimer looked dreadful in the third period. That's when you need your goalie to step up. I don't care what you did before that. If you're going to play under the bright lights, you've got to show up in the third period. It's just that simple. Bruce Cassidy has coached circles around Rod Brendamore. I give him full credit. The Hurricanes are done. I don't see how they come back from this. They're not winning three straight against this Bruins team. I'm not sold on this Bruins team going forward, but they're going to advance to the second round. I can say that confidently. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if Game 5 was a rout. Moving on now to Blues Canucks. And the Blues have surprised some people by coming back from 2-0 down to make it a best 2 out of 3. A lot of people are going to point to Jake Allen as being the seminal reason for that. And I don't want to take anything away from Allen. He's played great in these two games. He's only allowed three goals. But that's not the seminal factor to me. The seminal factor is their physical play. Craig Berube was a really physical player in his day. I mean, that's an understatement. The guy is very high up in the penalty minutes leaderboard. And if you go back to last year when the Blues won the Cup, they did it primarily because they were a really physical team. They were mucking it up in the corners... They were winning those battles. They were setting up their shooters. That's how they won, combined with great goaltending. But don't take anything away from the physical side of what they did. The Blues have gotten back to that. In Games 1 and 2, they were a little more finessey. Now they're getting back to their identity. Braden Shen has stepped up and has had a great last two games. And Ryan O'Reilly, too. Alex Petriangelo, also. David Perron, as well. I mean, the Blues are clicking on all cylinders now. They're getting back to what won them the Stanley Cup, and that should scare you if you're Travis Green. Now, Green's a really good coach. And this is what the Canucks need to do going forward. The Canucks need to find a way to neutralize it. Whether it's get more physical players in there. You know, maybe you throw the body around a little bit more. You've got to do something to neutralize it. The one guy who I would look to, to really step up in that regard, is Tyler Mott. A guy who has really disappointed all playoffs, but was second on the Canucks in hits with 118. He's got to step up and throw his body around. Be an inspiration to the rest of the team. And guys like Edler and Vertanen and Miller will fall right in line. All right, now it's time to preview today's four games. I'm not going to start with Capitals Islanders. I'll save that for later. I'll start with Flyers Canadians. This goes for both teams. Support your goalie. All right, I believe that game two was just an aberration. Anyone's allowed an off night. I mean, when you look at Carter Hart, I don't know why he was so bad in Game 2. The only thing I can think of is that he ate some bad shrimp. 
That's it. That's the only thing that pops into my mind. <laughs> but he came back and shut the Canadians out. We know how great he is. It's up to the Flyers to support him. The Flyers have only scored four goals in these three games. And the Canadians have only scored six. And five of them came in one game. I mean, that doesn't work for me. Both teams need to support their goalies. For the Flyers, I'm looking at the guys who got them here in the first place. Guys like Konechny, Couturier, Voracek, Giroux, Hayes, and JVR. And the Canadians, I'm looking at Tatar, Danol, Domi, Gallagher, Suzuki, um, Jesperi Kotkaniemi, Jeff Petrie, Shea Weber, Jonathan Drouin. Both teams need to support their goalie. It's just that simple. Moving on now to Flame Stars. And I have no idea. I mean, look. I said it yesterday. I have a tough time getting a handle on this series. One game they're up, one game they're down. One game they're up, one game they're down. I mean, I'll tell you. That goes for both teams. You've had some games where Cam Talbot has played great. And you've had other games where the stars have gotten to him. And Joe Pavelski and Jamie Benn have stepped up and have played really well. Both teams need to be consistent. Play 60 minutes of quality hockey. Whoever makes the fewest mistakes is going to win this game. I know that sounds cliche, but it's the best I can do because I have no idea what's really happening. In this series. I think both coaches are. Pulling their hair out. I know I would if I was Jeff Ward. Or uh, Rick Bonus. I think I said Jim Montgomery. In a previous podcast. It's Rick Bonus. Bonus replaced Montgomery earlier. In the season. I apologize for that. Alright now it's time for Capitals Islanders. And for the Capitals. They need to go the Islanders into making mistakes. They need to tick them off, make them commit stupid penalties. They're susceptible to that. We've seen that throughout the restart. The Islanders have thoroughly outplayed the Capitals in 5-on-5 play in this series, but when you look at Special teams, the Capitals are light years ahead. Hell, if I'm the Capitals, I wouldn't even mind purposely taking penalties. Get the Islanders on a power play. We know they're dreadful there. Jim Hiller doesn't know his ass from his elbow. I mean, it's just that simple. Maybe you can get some breakaway since there are less players on the ice. I know it's just one less player and you're at a disadvantage there, but you gotta try something. Your back's against the wall. As for the Islanders, just play Islanders hockey. Play great defense. Don't be stupid. Every single player needs to play great defense. The goals will come. Braden Holtby really hasn't been good this series. I mean, I still like Holtby, but my God, he's made me look stupid for supporting him. I mean, this is just a continuation of the bad year he had. I thought he'd turn it around and we'd see some low-scoring games, but he hasn't been able to. I do think he'll get it together next year, though. Just play smart if you're the Islanders. You really have this series in the bag. Just don't blow it. I mean... I'm going to say something kind of profound. No team has beaten the Islanders in the restart except the Islanders. Go back to Game 3 
the stupid bench minor for too many men, the stupid penalty by Varlamov, that's not on the Panthers doing anything smart. That's on the Islanders being stupid. Give the Panthers credit for capitalizing on it. But the Islanders gifted them that game. When the Islanders are playing smart, they're unbeatable. The last game to talk about is Blackhawks Golden Knights. For the Blackhawks, I think the series is going to end here. Corey Crawford isn't going to make 48 saves again. That's really the only way that the Blackhawks can win this game. If Corey Crawford stands on his head again, and you can't expect him to do that. Any player can go off on any given night. And that's what happened in Game 4. I don't see how the Blackhawks are going to win this series. As for the Golden Knights, don't get complacent. Keep Pepper and Corey Crawford. He will fold. I understand he didn't fold in Game 4, but it's going to happen tonight. Also, you've got to get the power play figured out. The Golden Knights are 0 for 9 on the power play in this series. Despite the fact that they actually had a pretty good power play in the regular season. They were ninth in the league. That's really how you're going to win this game, by generating quality chances on the power play. I do want to talk about a pretty notable death in the sports world yesterday. And I understand it's not an earth-shattering name or anything, but it does mean something to me. And that is the death of John Boyd Tiny Grant. I've heard him called Boyd Grant. I've heard him called Tiny Grant. Never John Grant. I learned it as Tiny Grant. But I'll probably just call him Grant here. In the 1980s, Grant was one of the better coaches in all of college basketball. This is a guy who worked really hard to get to where he did. He got his big break in 1977 when he took over as head coach at Fresno State. Before that, he had coached in high school. He had been an assistant coach at his alma mater, Colorado State, throughout the 60s and early 70s. Keep that in mind. He was an assistant coach on Joe B. Hall's staff at Kentucky. He then went to the College of Southern Idaho, which is in the NJCAA. But... Finally, after 18 years of scrounging, Grant got his opportunity. And immediately, Grant showed that he belonged. The 76-77 Fresno State Bulldogs went 7-20. They were 1-11 in conference play in the PCAA. Nowadays, that's known as the Big West, but when Grant was coaching... It was called the Pacific Coast Athletic Association. In Grant's first year, Fresno State went 21 and 6 and 11 and 3 in the conference to actually win the PCAA regular season championship. He got some really good production from Art Williams, Eddie Adams, and Doug Streeter. After that, the team was good, but not great for a couple years. It wasn't until 8081 that the team really, really hit its stride. With guys like Rod Higgins and Donald Mason and Bernard Thompson... And towards the last couple years of their glory days, guys like Tyrone Bradley and Scott Barnes really played well. Fresno State, in the early 80s, was a really good team. 
They made the big dance in 1981, but they got bounced in the first round by Northeastern. It was close. They only lost by two. The year after that, they beat WVU, but lost to uh, Georgetown. The year after that, they won the NITs. I mean, back then, the NITs were a much bigger deal than they are now. Ron Anderson had a great tournament that year en route to winning NIT MVP. And Fresno State was by far and away the better team in all of their games that year. The year after that, they made the big dance, but they lost to Louisiana Tech. After that, the Bulldogs went through a couple lean-ish years. They weren't great, but they weren't awful. He resigned after the 85-86 season, took a year off, And then he went to his alma mater to coach, Colorado State. He was there for four seasons. In three of those years, the Rams finished with over 20 wins. To put that in perspective, in 86-87, Colorado State went 13-16. The year after, they went 22-13. The year after that, they had a stifling defense to win the WAC regular season title. They received an at-large bid to March Madness that year. They destroyed Florida in the first round, but they got destroyed by Syracuse in the second round. Pat Durham and Joel Triplehorn were really good that year for Colorado State. The year after that, those two guys weren't there anymore. So Grant had to retool the team, but he did so very, very well. As in 89-90, the Rams repeated as WAC regular season champions. Again, they received an at-large bid to March Madness, but they got destroyed by Alabama in the first round. Mike Mitchell, Mark Meredith, Andy Anderson, and Lynn Tryon were really good that year for the Rams. Grant was an old-school coach. He believed that defense wins games. And look, While the teams he coached weren't offensive juggernauts, they were stifling defensively. His worst team defensively, when you look at points against per game at Fresno State, was the 79-80 team. That team was sixth in the nation in that metric. In other words, in Grant's nine years at Fresno State, the Bulldogs never finished with a defense that was out of the top six in terms of points against per game. And he had the same success at Colorado State. Their worst finish in points against per game was sixth. They didn't have good offenses, but they were just stifling defensively. In Grant's nine years with the Bulldogs, they led the nation in defense in terms of points against per game four times. And this is before Paul George ever stepped foot On the campus, Tiny Grant was a really good coach. He doesn't get remembered as such, unfortunately. 
Yesterday was his 87th birthday, but unfortunately, he wouldn't enjoy it because he passed away that day from a stroke. May he rest in peace. All right, here's my interview with Joe Sigmund. You're listening to The Jacob Valk Show. I am Jacob Valk, and I'm fortunate enough to be joined by Joe Sigmund, the author of Jewish Sports Legends, the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. Joe, how are you? I'm fine, Jacob. How are you? I'm doing good. Before we get started, I want to qualify myself for a moment. I actually had my bar mitzvah in Israel, and I spent two weeks there, traveled the whole country, stayed in a kibbutz for a little bit, and stayed in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, and went really all over the country. And I actually made a pit stop at the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. So, Joe, I've actually been there. How about that? Well, you're the first person... <clears throat> Excuse me, you're the first person to tell me that, that they stopped by uh, Wingate Institute is where the Hall of Fame is. Uh, right. I, I, I'm impressed. How did you know <laughs> it was there? Um, it was my father. Oh, okay. Yeah, my father is a big sports fan just like me, so he found out about it. I remember going, and I remember really liking it. So when I found out about this book, I was really excited to talk to you. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, you surprised me about about finding out about the book. The book isn't out yet. When does it come out? In two weeks. There are other editions of the book that have come out. The last one was in 2005, but this new one will be out at at the last week of August. Well, I can promise you that you're going to see an increase in pre-orders because of this interview, all right? Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. (laughs) You're very welcome. So, what's something that most people don't know about Red Auerbach? Red Auerbach uh, was a player. They, uh, you never hear anybody talk about him being a player. He was a player before he became a coach. And uh, he didn't coach the Celtics the first time around. Uh, for, he, I think he... Oh, I can't say. I think it was a team that no longer exists. You know, when the NBA began, first of all, they weren't the NBA. They were the ABL, I believe. NBL, yeah. And then uh, teams dropped out. Teams came in, and they finally organized into the NBA. And uh, teams fell out and in as time went on. Franchises moved, and uh, Auerbach was not a, a, um, a coach at the beginning in the NBA. Uh, I don't know if that, uh, that helps you out with your question. I can't tell you what kind of cigars he used to smoke. <laughs> you, know, used to, you know, he was famous for lighting up a cigar. Right. Uh, when he thought the, uh, the Celtics had the game and, uh, won, even though it was the middle of the fourth quarter, which breeded hate from everybody else. You know, if you're playing him and he's sitting on the bench celebrating with the cigar and you're still trying to beat his team and the, and the game is close enough that you can beat his team, uh, he developed a reputation to be disliked, but he was always um, appreciated by uh, the people who do basketball. Yes, he was. Fantastic coach for the Celtics. No question about that. So, can you describe the career of Benny Friedman? I really, you know, I, I can tell you a little bit about him. He, he was, uh, in, in, in the days when he played, you could be a triple threat guy. Uh, and the offensive players, used, like he, uh, Benny Friedman is known for his offensive uh, playing. He played for Michigan football. He was a quarterback, but he also played defense. They didn't run off the field, you know, when when the ball turned over to the other side. And um, Benny Friedman uh, was a passer, a runner, 
a kicker, a defensive player. He was seldom off the field. And when he graduated uh, Michigan, uh, he became a franchise in the what was then the early NFL uh, all by himself, and they built a team around him. Unfortunately, I, I never got to meet uh, Benny. He was elected to the Hall of Fame the first year, and right before our uh, Hall of Fame dinner here in Los Angeles, that was 1979, he had his uh, leg amputated. He had been a coach in New York. Uh, I forget what college, but he was a coach there. And uh, he was in a state of depression. And uh, so I didn't get to meet him. He didn't attend our, our affair here. We had a wonderful event, which kicked off really the Hall of Fame because the Hall of Fame wasn't supposed to be a Hall of Fame. It was a fundraising dinner for the Maccabee Games, and you know what those are. Right. And um, and then he died right after that. But I know he was an All-American, All-American. He was followed by, um, all of a sudden I can't think of his name, the, the quarterback that followed him was uh, also Jewish, Newman. Uh, and he also was a triple threat guy. And back in those days, one man could make the difference in whether you were a winner or a loser. Obviously, other people had to play the game with you and support you. Uh, but one superstar can make a game, make, could make a, uh, a team a top contender. Anyways, that's what I know about Benny Friedman. No, that's fine. The idea was not to write a Pulitzer Prize winning book, but was to identify these Jewish athletes and sportsmen, sportswomen, who have contributed to the highest levels of sports. Did uh, you ever see Airplane? Let me ask you that. Did you ever see Airplane? Well, that was an inspiration. Yeah, I'm sure it was. <laughs> the, smallest book, the smallest books in the world. Yeah, how about some light reading? <laughs> but you know, but, but you know, those kinds of of uh, quips, uh, jokes come from Jewish comics. Right. They didn't. They don't know. They know know about the comics that were. If they know about any, they know about the players like Sandy Koufax or Hank Greenberg, or if you were a boxing fan, uh, there were a lot of guys to hang your hat on. But they knew of Benny Leonard. Or, or, or Barney Ross, but they didn't know of all the other people, you know, over 30 boxing cha Jewish boxing champions. But even my dad was a boxing fan. He used to pull up his chair to the radio like it was, uh, yeah, like he would hear the, the, the fight better. He, he could see the fight through the ra radio to listen to a boxing match. Uh, but he couldn't tell you all, all the Jewish boxers because they, most of the time... They weren't sure if they were Jewish or Italian or Greek or Irish, like, like Kid McCoy was Jewish. Is that right? Yeah. That I didn't know. Well, back in the day, uh, you got your gate from, you got your uh, your purse, the money from a fight uh, by the gate, the people who paid to come in. So yeah. if you were a lightweight and there were no... Uh, top lightweights in the uh, in that division, they would uh, some guy would change his name to Kid McCoy. There's a guy on our ballot this year for the Hall of Fame, Newsboy Brown. Okay. Could you tell he's Jewish? I couldn't tell he's Jewish. But no, not is, at all. His name is David Montrose. You know, so they they change their name to fit their business that they were in, and. Uh, uh, anyways, uh, the uh, whole idea of the Hall of Fame was to call attention to great Jewish athletes, Jew to to call attention to great athletes who were also Jewish, not great Jewish athletes. If you follow that train thought. No, I I got you, I got you. So let's uh, fast forward a little bit in time. Will you be able to lay out something that most people don't know about Sean Green? Well, his family name was Greenberg. Really? Yeah. Huh. Uh, there's, uh, there's a uh, story in 
think the fifth edition of Total Baseball. It's a, it's a uh, stats book and with stories also by David Spader, S-P-A-N-E-R, who's a Canadian uh, writer. And the story is from Greenberg to Green. And it, it really is from Greenberg to Greenberg because the second Greenberg is, is short green. <laughs> and, uh, and But, you know, people change their name. I have... My uh, mother's family name is Goldzweig, but I have a cousin named Gold. So, yeah, that was done. Uh, that was done. P- people do it less now, but they still do it. Right, uh, right. Uh, Sh- uh, Sean Green, well, I got to see him a lot because he was with the Dodgers, and I, uh, uh, my client, uh, I had a client, uh, the Dodgers, and so I was at a lot of games that I used to see him. And I have to be honest, watching him play, he was so unspectacular to me. But he did, spe- <laughs> but he did spectacular things. You know, there are players who catch spectacularly. They they uh, they uh, they run spectacularly. They slide. They they do everything that that's uh, that stands out. All, all Sean Greenberg did was great things, but he did it so effortlessly. That's what it seemed like to me. And he also married one of the most beautiful women you ever saw. Who did he marry? Just, uh, I don't know, I met her at a, at a dinner one night. Oh, okay. And he was with her at a dinner, and uh, he was, she was very pretty. Those baseball players, they got all the gorgeous women. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, he's not a bad-looking guy, you know. No, he's not. <laughs> Talking to Joe Sigmund, the author of Jewish Sports Legends, the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. So what can you tell us about Hank Greenberg's quest in 1938 to break Babe Ruth's single-season home run record? He, he never, I never heard him say, and I never saw him quoted as saying, that he thought that the rest of the players, his opponents, try to keep him from breaking that record, try to keep him, uh, keep him a Jew from breaking Babe Ruth's record. But um, you know, of course, about his sitting out. Uh, well, it was that was a different year. The uh, Yom Kippur sitting out on Yom Kippur. He he just didn't reach it. He. he I would think by looking at his record, if you look at his record, and you can't just look at the record, actually. You have to go, I mean, the stats record. You have to go look at the game-by-game record of how many times he walked, and uh, which meant that each time he walked, he didn't get a chance to get it at bat to maybe even get a home run. Um, he, he, he was a marvelous man. Uh, I, I met him out here. And um, he really didn't want to be, uh, he, he was tired of being, in my opinion, he was tired of being the, the classic Jew baseball player who everybody was uh, referring to. When you had to mention a great Jewish athlete, right away it was Hank Greenberg. And this was at a time when I met him when Sandy Koufax was uh, just, he had just quit. So you ask anybody over 50 uh, who was the greatest Jewish baseball player, they would say, hey, Greenberg. And I had a meeting with him, and he was such a nice guy. And he he, he talked a little bit about, and and some of his cronies were there, not baseball players, but uh, friends from out here in Beverly Hills. Um, he, He... he just uh, spoke of the years as a, a wonderful experience of his own life. And he didn't just stop uh, playing because he didn't get the, the 60 home runs or because he had a great career when it ended. He stayed in baseball as a general manager and as a part owner of a couple of teams. So he, he just was a good man who had a great talent at a time in today's world, he'd have probably hit uh, 70 home runs and 75 right. home runs. No question. 
No question about that at all. But um, he, he, I, I really enjoyed his time. He told me, he told me at, at our first uh, Hall of Fame uh, dinner when we uh, inducted the first 18 people, he came over to me after the dinner and said, you know, this was a wonderful event. And I thanked him, of course, and he said, but don't make the hall, getting into the Hall of Fame, the Jewish Hall of Fame, too easy. As far as I'm concerned, most Hall of Fames make it too easy. They, they put people I in agree they with want you. to put it. Anyways, I agree with that, you. Was, that was that. So you brought up Koufax a little bit earlier. Can you lay out what exactly happened with him and the 1965 World Series? Actually, he belonged to the same temple that I did. Did he really? Earlier. Yeah. Uh, everybody knew that Sandy Koufax be- uh, be- belonged there. He was an active player at the time. And they said he was in temple at that time. But he wasn't in temple at that time. I remember myself turning around looking to see him, you know, if he was there. I mean, not only me, everybody was waiting to see what he was going to walk in. But I understand he stayed home. Uh, some say that he stayed home. Others said he stayed in a hotel that night, and he didn't play. And uh, the the legend built up, just like all legends built up. One person says something, and some people takes that take that track, and it becomes uh, a major production. And it's hard to disprove. But uh, he did not come to the ballpark. I I, I was with the Dodgers at that time. They were a client of mine, and, and he did not come to the ballpark. And uh, he was set to have stayed at home. I was told he stayed in a hotel. Okay. All right, That that's interesting. So would you be able to describe the career of Sid Luckman? Well, I'm from Chicago, and Sid Luckman was one of my idols. I didn't have too many idols. They were, and if I did, they were Chicago Cubs. Uh, players, but Sid uh, Luckman was in college. There was no T formation in the 1930s in the college college uh, football. It was the single wing or or versions of that. And uh, George Hallis, who was the owner and manager and coach of the of the Dodgers of the Bears, Chicago Bears, drafted him. In uh, the, I think it was the 1938 draft for the Bears, and he taught Sid Luckman his idea of quarterbacking, which was became called the T formation. And uh, Luckman was not only a passing quarterback in college; he was a running quarterback too. He also played defense, by the way. He was the safety on his team on Michigan, the Michigan, yeah, Michigan. Um, and he took to it like a duck takes to water. He, he was wonderful. And, uh, I mean, he ran up some some scores that were out of this world. And I saw him. I was a little kid, but uh, I, I remember him. Uh, at least I think I remember him. He was one of the big guys with, with helmets and, and shoulder pads, and I was a little guy. Talking to Joe Sigmund, the author of Jewish Sports Legends, the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. So what can you tell us about Ron Mix? Ron Mix is also a, a wonderful person. I, I, I don't mean to say that every Jewish guy in the Hall of Fame is a wonderful person, but you're picking on people who are very nice. Uh, Ron <laughs> Mix... Uh, Ron Mix uh, uh, was uh, uh, a top draft of the Los Angeles Chargers. They used to be an AFL team here. And he played for them one year, and the Chargers moved to San Diego. And he flourished there. He was a uh, all-NBA, all-NFL uh, uh, for every year that he was uh in San Diego, which I think was eight or nine years, and uh, then he went back, or he, he went to Oakland for a season or two. Al Davis brought him back. But he was, he gave a speech at his induction into the Hall of Fame 
that it's a shame that we didn't videotape that or film it or record it because he talked about what it meant to be Jewish playing pro football. And he t told a story about uh, Jimmy Kahn, James Kahn, the actor, was going to be doing the movie um, uh, about uh, the guy who died. Oh, You're Brian describing Piccolo. a lot of people. <laughs> Brian, Brian, no, no, no. He was Brian a Piccolo. Uh, uh, Brian Piccolo. And uh, uh, Khan came to a practice with the, uh, when, he, uh, when uh, Bix was with the uh, Raiders and w went over to him and, and said, Mr. Khan, I'm, I'm Mr. Bix, I'm Jimmy Khan. Well, Bix, of course, knew who, who Khan was. And he says, you were my inspiration, Khan said, you were my inspiration in college that um, I was reluctant to try out for college football because I was the only Jew that was there. I think he played in Florida, Jimmy Khan. And, um, and, and, and Mick said he was so moved by that, that a guy who became famous and was playing a football player uh, had taken the, the opportunity to come up and say what he said to him. He was just very impressed by that. And he told that story when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. And he also told that at an NFL uh, dinner. I, I was not at the NFL dinner, but he told that story again. Ron Mix was, is, still is. He's involved in the Jewish community. He lives out in the San Diego area. He's an attorney. And uh, from what I understand, uh, leads a very nice life. He's a judge, I believe. I didn't know judge. that, that he became a judge. That I didn't know. Yeah, well, right. you learn one thing talking to me. <laughs> I'm learning more than that, I'll tell you that. Okay. So, can you lay out the career of Al Rosen? Oh, wow. Al Rosen was a star in the 1940s baseball player and fielder uh, in the Cle Cleveland Indians uh, organization. They brought him up at the end of one year, and uh, he did okay. They sent him back, and he, ca he came up the next year and started with the team and was sensational. And uh, had he played another year or two, he would have probably been in the Hall of Fame in his first year that he left baseball. He uh, was almost a triple crown winner one one year. He uh, won the uh, he w won the RBI title and the uh, home run title, and he was like one or two percentage points uh, off winning the uh, the batting title. He came in second, but he was a, a terrific uh, terrific player. He hurt himself. And it became too painful for him to play. It's kind of interesting. Two great Jewish players, baseball players, uh, Rosen and Koufax, both both quit at the top of their game because <laughs> of uh, injuries. But he's never been elected to the Hall of Fame. Uh, Rosen became a general manager and an owner of uh, various teams, including the San Francisco uh, Giants. And he was uh, GM of the Yankees for a little bit. That's right, GM. See, I learned something. There you go. <laughs> hey, I'm a Yankees fan, so if I don't know that, I'm in trouble. <laughs> oh, okay. So, would you be able to describe the career of Dolph Shays? Dolph Shays, the first power forward. They didn't have that phrase before, power forward. Dolph uh, was, <laughs> here I go again with great guys. Dolph was... Go ahead. Al Rosen's also a nice guy. I, I met him once. Well, I only met him at the dinner that we uh, where we inducted him, and he was very I nice. The, I met him once at an autograph signing. He was really nice uh, there, too. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Dolph uh, was a great uh, college player. He uh, pl played uh, in, in football. Uh, in, in basketball, he really dominated the game at his position, and uh, that, I, those were the years I think he played for Syracuse. Dolph became friendly with, we became friends, and um, 
Uh, I saw him a few times when I was back east. He uh, he he showed up to promote uh, the 205 2005 book at a a, a hostel, a uh, Jewish hostel in the uh, Catskills for me. And uh, when we were in Israel, I don't know, I think it was either 93 or 97 for the Maccabea games. He and I, my wife didn't come and his wife didn't come. So we both traversed all the different events that we could get in in the Maccabea that year. Those were the Maccabea games years. And um, uh, we spent a lot of time watching basketball together. He he was just uh, he was a pussycat, and he um, he loved to kid people. He, he and he was as rough as you got. He was the guy that he was the um, uh, what, what's the guy? Uh, he was the Barkley of his time. He did play a little like Barkley. That's a good comparison. I like that. Little smaller, well, but still a great rebounder. A great rebounder. Remember the keyhole when it was called the keyhole. You know what I'm talking about in basketball? Truthfully, no, I don't. I've never heard that term. Okay, where the free throw line is, and then the the lines where you stand for to get a rebound. Right. It's okay. Kind of a U shaped thing. Yeah. That was used to be called the keyhole. It was shaped like a keyhole. So the players were in closer to the basket. They moved it out to uh, diminish the, uh, the, uh, the the importance uh, or uh, uh, of uh, the tall the tall players because the big guys were right next to the basket and they used to be able to control the boards more than uh, than they can now. Now mostly the second guy. Well, it depends on where the ball the, uh, the ball jumps out if it jumps out. But anyways. In the keyhole, when he was standing in the first position, which was right opposite the basket, you forget about it. You're not going to get a rebound against him. And um, when he retired, he led the NBA in five categories, including scoring. And the person who beat his or topped his scoring record was uh, Will Chamberlain. And that's pretty good when Chamberlain's the guy who needs to beat you. Talking to Joe Sigmund, the author of Jewish Sports Legend, the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. And, Joe, I'll get you out on this. What can you tell us about what Mark Spitz did in the 1972 Olympics under the specter of the Munich Massacre? Well, he won his last uh, medal, his seventh medal, the day before the massacre happened. The massacre happened that night. It started. After his, after his day, his last day, the, uh, the Palestinians uh, took their hostages. Mark told me this story. Uh, the uh, authorities didn't know how far the terrorist attack was going to be. Uh, first of all, they never had heard of the uh, Black September group. And, uh, they, you know, the, the word terrorist, there was Arab terrorists at that time they were called. They still are Arab terrorists, but they were called there. And they didn't know how large the attack was going to be. So they, the authorities, the good authorities, took Spitz, and they secreted him, secreted him out of the compound there. According to Mark, I don't know if you know the story, the, the, um, uh, the terrorists were put into a, a bus uh, uh, that was in a, uh, 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 an area that was aside from normal people going. They were, they were going to be bused to the airport. There was another bus there, and that's the one they took Spitz away on. They they took him to the airport, got him to fly to Germany, and then he got eventually got back home. Uh, there were some Americans there that uh, 
were fans of his. One of them was Kirk Douglas, the actor. Really? Yeah. And he helped, I understand, he helped in some way uh, speed up the, or protect, uh, he speed up the protection for Spitz. I asked Spitz once, uh, we spent some time together in Israel and a, a little bit here in Los Angeles. I asked him why he didn't write a book, because nobody knows that story. Uh, he just wasn't uh, into doing it. Uh, but he said his bus passed the bus that held the, the terrorists. He didn't know who, who was in the bus, the terrorist bus, until after he passed it. But they got him right to the airport and out of, out of the country because they thought that it, there might be an attack on Spitz. Obviously, Spitz was getting so much publicity as a Jewish swimmer and winning all those medals, he would be a good target. But they weren't looking to kill just average, everyday American Jews. They were looking to kill Israelis, which they did. Yes, they did. And one of the darkest moments in sports history, we've all seen the clip of um, one of the Black September members looking outside on the balcony in a mask. Yeah. It's one of the most sickening images you'll ever see in your life. Yeah. All right, Joe, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jacob. Good All luck. right. Thank you. Bye-bye. That was Joe Sigmund. His book is Jewish Sports Legends, the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. Thanks for listening. Here comes the outro. Thanks for the plug, Jacob, from the past. It does mean a lot. Until tomorrow, I am Jacob Valk saying that Freddie Patek was so small that when he was born, his father passed out cigar butts.